Good evening, uh, everybody. My name is Alistair Jones, and I'm the Deputy Vice-Chancellor of the University of Waikato, and it's my pleasure to welcome you here uh, to the second lecture in this year's Winter Lecture Series. First of all, I'd like to pass on the apologies of our Vice-Chancellor, Professor Roy Crawford, who is not able to be here today. Before we get started, um, I'd like to advise of some health, housekeeping matters. Uh, if you'd like to use the amenities, the restrooms are located in the foyer opposite the Opus Bar. In case of emergency, please exit via the doors at each side of the Opus Bar. Ushers and event staff are on hand to assist you uh, out safely. The assembly area is outside the academy and the shops, and you're not to re-enter the building until the all clear is given by the front of house manager or personnel. I had to read those words exactly. Uh, so if you could also check um, that your mobile phones and devices are turned off. Uh, the, in, the Winter Lecture Series is where we take the opportunity to showcase to the community the wealth of knowledge and expertise that is on hand at the university, among our, among our academics and their various research projects, and also our alumni and guest speakers. One of the important things of a university is the way we connect with our community, both in terms of the knowledge that uh, we convey, but inviting people into the, our community as well. This year's series is a special one. We are marking 50 years of teaching and research excellence at this university. 2014 Winter Lecture Series has a forward-focused theme as we look to the future and start thinking about the next 50 years and beyond. Tonight's lecture focuses on the future of cyber security. And just prior to this event, we had the unveiling of a plaque commemorating the date John Hawker plugged New Zealand into the internet right here at the University of Waikato. The plaque will be available for viewing in the foyer after the lecture. It is now my pleasure to introduce to you tonight's facilitator, Senior Lecturer in Law, Brenda Midson. Brenda will introduce each of tonight's speakers, keeping them, of course, to time and taking any questions at the end of presentations. Thank you very much, Brenda. Thank you, Professor Jones. I'm a senior lecturer here at Te Paringa Faculty of Law, where I teach in criminal law and evidence, and also in criminology, which looks at the vast range of human behaviours and asks, among other things, why certain acts are criminalised and others not, and also what can be done to regulate new and emerging areas of potentially criminal behaviour. We've already been talking uh, on the stage tonight about some really high-tech stuff, including how to get the best selfies. Apparently you take them from up high. And also we've been talking about the Kardashians. So uh, it's a pleasure to be here facilitating this winter lecture series session. Tonight we're going to hear from Martin Cocker, who's the Chief Executive of NetSafe. We'll be hearing from Dr Ryan Coe, who's a Senior Lecturer here at the University in Computing and Mathematical Sciences, and he's also Head of the Cyber Security Lab, and also Senior Lecturer in Law, Wayne Rumbles. And I'll briefly introduce each of them to you before we hear Martin speak, and Martin will be our first speaker tonight. Martin joined NetSafe as Chief Executive in 2006 after working in the ICT industry for 12 years. NetSafe's an independent, non-profit organisation that promotes safe and responsible use of online technologies. They have several partnerships across a range of sectors and groups, all working across cyberbullying, cybersecurity, educational resources, consumer protection and policy advice and development in New Zealand and also across the Pacific. Recent projects include the creation of the NetSafe Cyberbullying Task Force, involvement with the government's new cyber security strategy, and the development of consumer advice around smartphone security. Dr Ryan Coe is Senior Lecturer at, in the Faculty of Computing and Mathematical Sciences. Ryan is an acknowledged expert in cloud computing security. He's also Head of the University's Cyber Security Lab. Prior to joining the University of Waikato, Ryan was lead computer scientist with Hewlett Packard Labs, Cloud and Security Lab, and he's a co-chair and board member of several cybersecurity industry bodies. In 2012, 
Ryan was a recipient of the Ron Node Service Award for his volunteer efforts with the not-for-profit Cloud Security Alliance. Wayne Rumbles graduated from the University of Waikato in 1997 with Bachelors of Art and Law, and in 1998 with his Masters in Law. He then spent three years working in community law and for 10 years for Te Matahauraiki Research Institute on the laws and institutions for Aotearoa New Zealand project. Wayne teaches in the areas of crime, criminology, cyber law and legal responses to new technologies. And he also teaches in the Masters of Cyber Security. Wayne's current research projects include the sentencing of hacker crimes across jurisdictions and the legal issues of cloud computing. As I said, we'll first hear from Mr Cocker, then Dr Coe, followed by Mr Rumbles. So would you please welcome Martin Cocker. Uh, thank you. I don't often get called Mr Cocker, um, mostly because people try to avoid Cocker for obvious reasons. Uh, all right, because uh, I work in technology, I, I'm very confident with technology and I therefore don't do any prep work like seeing how stuff works before I get on stage. So, <laughs> Ooh. all right, that's going well. Um, so, NetSafe, as was just mentioned, is a, uh, a not-for-profit. Uh, our job is to try to create a safer, more secure online environment in New Zealand uh, and help New Zealanders uptake digital opportunities. Um, I cut and paste some of these slides from presentations I give around the world where I uh, take some of our local culture to the world, which is why you'll see that the, there's the odd uh, local Maori proverb. And in this case, uh, people say to me, isn't cyber safety and you know, trying to educate people about all these challenges you know, an impossible task? And I say, well, we won't die like an octopus, we'll die like a hammerhead shark, which apparently means, you know, go down fighting. Uh, so on that upbeat start, let's talk about what NetSafe does. Uh, and I see that uh, nobody's taking notes. So uh, pretty much anything you need to know you can st about NetSafe and NetSafe's education program and the information NetSafe holds, you can find somewhere linked off netsafe.org.nz. So that's all you've got to remember. That's your take home from Martin. I'm sure Ryan will have lots more. It'll be much harder. You'll probably want to take notes. Netsafe.org.nz. Uh, and, uh, and we work a lot with schools. So if you've got children and, uh, or grandchildren, they're in schools. Uh, it's, it's likely those schools are engaged with Netsafe through uh, their own specific resources and, and processes, uh, trying to create a safe environment at school and help young kids to become what we call digital citizens and you know, capable users of technology. Uh, we work with lots of other groups. This is the output of the Ministry of Education's led uh, bullying prevention advisory group, the BPAG, which has a cyberbullying spin-off, the CBPAG, because we like to have acronyms in ICT and apparently in education. So we work with lots of other groups on projects like that. Uh, and we have something called the ORB, which is uh, a place where you can report cyber crimes and cyber offences. So when you come across something online that you think looks like a crime or an offence, you can go to the orb.org.nz. Or if you forget that it's called the orb, you can go to netsafe.org.nz and find it from there. So what do we see from the orb? We see how, uh, what uh, challenges New Zealanders are facing online. And uh, each year, in the, for the last couple of years in the orb, we've received um, reports with a total financial loss of $5 million. So one of the questions people ask a lot is, how big, how big a problem is cybercrime in New Zealand? Well. That's the reported losses to us, but uh, a couple of years ago, Norton did a report and they said that the cost of cyber crime to New Zealand was $660 million. And they were widely criticised for, you know, pulling this number out. Uh, but then they did the same research a couple of years later and they found that, uh, that the, just the straight financial loss cost of cyber crime was $400 million. Um, but of course, this is all extrapolated from you know, how many people may or may not have um, it's good feedback. Uh, how many people may or may not have, uh, have um, uh, lost money due to uh, security incidents and so forth? So what we can say is that uh, the problem is getting worse uh, because um, NZ Stats, who are a pretty reliable gatherer of information, they do something called the ICT Household Labour Force Survey. No, the ICT doesn't matter. Uh, they do the Household Labour Force Survey ICT section. And they asked people who had suffered a loss uh, as a result of some cyber security incident or, or cyber crime. And the first time they did the report back in uh, 2009, 
2% of people said they'd suffered. In 2012, uh, that number had risen to 4%. And if you extrapolate the average loss in the orb by 4% of New Zealanders, then you get a number about $150 million. So whatever it is, between $150 million and $660 million, it's quite a lot of money. And the trends that we are seeing. So uh, everybody here will have heard about uh, Rod Drury and Zero and how he's taking his accounting product to the world and he's doing really well. And the People talk often about the flat earth and weightless economy. Uh, and basically all that means is that um, you, know, you don't have to export because, uh, on IT, you just plug into the internet and you're in another country. Well, cyber criminals have worked that out too, so they plug in in one place and then they, uh, they attack another country. And uh, what we're seeing is a trend in terms of countries are becoming one or the other, either a, a perpetrator country or a victim country. And um, you'll be saddened to know, New Zealand is a victim country that uh, you know, we're mostly losing money and sending it off offshore. Our criminals haven't cottoned onto the opportunity yet, and they're not bringing money back into the country. <laughs> so uh, although I was with some law enforcement guys the other day, and they were very confident that our criminals would catch up. So <laughs> you know, it's, it's pa uh, patriotism at its best there. And the other thing we're seeing uh, is these data breaches on a mass scale. So this is just a, a screen grab from a, uh, a a graphic, a cool interactive thing where you can go through and you can have a look at all the major data breaches over the, uh, over the last little while. And some of them are gigantic. So the eBay one stands out there in the middle with 145 million lost records. Uh, but, you know, Evernote, Facebook, Living Social, uh, Apple, America Online, they're all losing, from time to time, large chunks of data. And that data then floats around uh, and criminals can access it. Uh, and despite our best efforts, you know, that information is, is out there. So as I mentioned, uh, you know, cr criminals are cottoning on to the opportunity of, of the digital age. And, and uh, you know, we can assume that whatever is the next technology, and, you know, we could probably get a futurist up here and they'd wow us with all these new technologies. And then someone who's slightly pessimistic about, uh, you know, cybersecurity and cybercrime, like Ryan, uh, could uh, identify all the ways that, that will be exploited by, by cybercriminals. But basically, we try to put things into three buckets, and this is a bit of a theoretical thing for us cyber safety buffs. Uh, the three areas, cyber security, cyber safety, and cyber crime. Cyber safety is about people and their actions, and therefore their mistakes. So, uh, you know, I might take a picture of myself in the bathroom, forget that I didn't have any clothes on, uh, and accidentally upload it. That would be a, just a pure cyber safety error. Um, actually, I'm sorry I sort of created that example. <laughs> Could be a bit awkward. <laughs> supposed to picture the crowd naked, eh? Not the presenter. Um, if if I sent that picture to my uh, uh, beloved, and, and then we broke up, and uh, and she, you know, blackmailed me with it, that would be a criminal act, and it, and it would be something which was both a cyber safety error and a, and a cyber crime. If somebody hacked my phone and stole those images and then blackmailed me with it, it would be a cybersecurity, cyber safety, and cyber crime issue. And it's in that area where these different uh, um, challenges overlap that the, you have the most interesting cases, from our perspective, and, and also the most difficult challenges because organisations don't tend to be skilled at uh, all, all three of those areas. So just thought I'd run through a couple of their sort of um, favourite scams, uh, what's happening at the moment. So who's been called by the PC doctor or someone from Microsoft or some other agency, now it's telecom actually, um, to help you with your computer? Just show of hands. All right, they really do well, don't they? They've got great coverage, these guys. Um, I won't ask who's handed them money, but people do. Uh, and um, the reason that people do is because uh, it's, they've got a really you know, clever model that they've refined over the last few years, and it's quite compelling. Uh, so we're seeing a lot of the PC doctor, and that was uh, indicated by what happened here. Uh, we've seen quite a lot of uh, attacks on what you call sort of secondary sources of funds. So uh, trade me account, there's no money in your trade me account. Well, except for the little bit of credit you give TradeMe to run your, your trades. Um, but your TradeMe account is valuable, so, so people target those uh, en masse, and you know, from time to time we see TradeMe here locally targeted that way. We had a lady ring up and say, um, oh, it's terrible, help me, I've lost the farm. <laughs> and uh, that was quite confusing for the staff, because we are like, uh, you know, this is a cyber safety organisation. Uh, but it turned out the farm she was talking about was Farmville. And uh, she was very upset, but what had happened is someone had hacked her Facebook account uh, and the thing that she was most concerned about was that uh, she'd lost control of her Farmville farm and the crops would die. Um, 
But of course, the biggest problem was that somebody was now in control of her Facebook account, and we're seeing this quite a bit, and therefore, and then connecting with her contacts and saying to her things like, uh, uh, to, the, to her contacts, you know, I'm stuck in a foreign country, I'm in London, I've been jammed up, I lost some money, etc. Um, and they also use the now, they've moved from just posting to, uh, to using the uh, live chat within these products. So they wait to see who of your friends are online and then they live chat with them. And you'd think, you know, surely with a, a live text chat, you'd sort of recognize it wasn't your friend because they wouldn't be using the normal kind of language they use. But people do fall for this on a, on a regular basis because, you know, you just don't think the person who's pretending to be your friend is not your friend. Uh, we see quite a few trading scams, um, uh, international trading scams. So we had one where a guy brought a tractor overseas, typical kind of a thing. You put down a deposit, uh, they send you a shipping document, let you know, tractor's on the way. Tractor got stuck in Madagascar, we need some more money to clear it, Madagascar customs, etc. They just keep asking for money until you realise it's a scam. And, uh, and people hand over lots and lots of small chunks of money. I say small chunks of money, in that case it was a total of sort of $70,000. But often it's... $1,000, $2,000, and then when, when you add it all up, it's ten, twenty thousand dollars $20,000. Romance scams, everybody's favourite, very compelling. Uh, romance scams, we don't see as many romance scams as the other ones, but they tend to be very high value. Once you're committed to a relationship, you tend to pour a lot of money into it. That's true whether it's a scam one or a real one. Um, and... <laughs> And, uh, and so we see a lot of people, uh, when we see romance scams, when people report them, they tend to have big financial losses associated with them. Uh, popular at the moment, jump online, going back to the bathroom story again, take your clothes off, um, have a, a bit of adult play uh, online. Happening quite a lot. Sometimes the person on the other end records it and then writes to you later on and says, I recorded that session we had online. Uh, please give me some money, or please, they're so polite, they're not like this, give me money, uh, or I will tell your uh, boss, or I'll release the video, or I'll tell your family. And, and you know, um, that's a pretty compelling uh, uh, argument. And everybody's, uh, everybody's personal favourite in the security industry, crypto locker. Your uh, computer gets infected with some malware, and uh, you get a message on your screen to tell you that it's, your computer's been locked. Now, it's very seldom that they say, I mean, a couple of them do, just say, look, we're criminals and we've locked your computer, but most of them tend to pop up a message that says, we're the FBI or we're a foreign you know, police agency and you've been doing something you shouldn't, and give us money and we'll unlock your computer. Um, the better crypto locker programs are, the encryption is near on, it's, it's realistically irreversible. So if you get it, you're stuffed unless you pay the ransom, or you had the data backed up. And so, unfortunately, quite a few people pay the ransom. So just in terms of what do, you, what do we do as a, as a country or as individuals, uh, you know, how do we make the, uh, the environment safer, the internet safer? So the first problem is we have to define the, uh, the internet as two separate things. On the one layer, the internet is a bunch of uh, devices that operate to a standard and pass data around. That is the internet. The guy on the bottom, Vint Cerf, he sort of invented the way it works now. Then there's the web layer. That's what we think of when people say the internet. We're really thinking of the web layer. And the guy on the top, Tim Berners-Lee, he's the guy who, who has invented the kind of uh, the, the protocols that we use and make the internet work on that level. So uh, the problem is neither of them are particularly governed with the idea of safety in mind. The internet is designed to pass data around as effectively as possible. And the web is just, I don't think it was really designed, it's just just a standard and, and you know, people build whatever they want on it. So uh, starting at that kind of international let's fix the internet layer doesn't really sort of work. So what you end up doing is you end up uh, trying to protect yourself at the edge. That's us. And so we make security decisions at the edge of the internet to, to protect ourselves. The problem is there's a whole lot of devices on the edge. Uh, in, in my house I think there's sort of 14 or 15. Now I, I might be slightly more inclined to have lots of technical toys than the average person, but if you count in your house between your smartphones and your laptops and your tablets and if you bought one of those new Samsung TVs, you'll find there's a whole lot of things that attach to the internet, things you don't even think about like the games console and so forth. There's basically three things that protect these computers or these devices at a, at a core level. Four, I suppose, if you count well designed in the first place. Uh, but there are three things that we think about. One is that the, the device is constantly up to date. 
whatever is the software on, it's up to date. So if anyone owns a PlayStation, then every, day, every now and then you jump online to play on your PlayStation, and the PlayStation says, sorry, I've got to do an update. And as frustrating as that is, that's actually quite a good design because they're saying, we know that there's something about this design, this machine that has to be updated, and we're not going to give you the choice to avoid it. Right? So they, and other devices where you have the choice, people sometimes make that choice, which makes them vulnerable. So keeping things up to date. The other thing is some sort of security software. So on the PlayStation, any security software is built in by Sony. But on my uh, Apple phone, if I want security software, I've got to get a third-party app and put that on. On my laptop, I put it on. Really, the idea of security software is when other things go wrong, the security software sort of kicks in and saves us. It doesn't do everything, but that's kind of its job. It's sort of milling around on your computer waiting for you to make a mistake and then try to reverse that mistake. Uh, and then the other thing that we have is we have some sort of firewalling system. Firewalls are mostly invisible now. We used to have to turn them on only five years ago. You'd turn on a firewall. But a firewall is essentially something that stops a person looking into the device from the outside, seeing what's on the inside of the device. That's the best way to describe it. It's like a couple of doors that are offset. And when you look in, you can't see what through the other door. Uh, and most devices have a firewall uh, set by default to on. If they don't, then it's like a, just a pipe straight through. The other thing that we can do is we can make the environment, uh, we, can, we can use regulations and law to make the environment safer. Now this is obviously... Uh, poses some challenges, which I think may be discussed a little bit later on, uh, in terms of jurisdiction. But there, are, there is a, a piece of law before the House, before Parliament at the moment, called the Harmful Digital Communications Bill. And there's actually a really interesting lesson in that law for us non-legal people. And that is that there are safety processes developing organically in the environment, and that if you think about regulation smartly, you use that, you build on the existing processes. Now, I don't want to get too nerdy, but I have put up a lot of arrows. And just to explain how this works, if you have a problem on Facebook, you can report to Facebook. But you can also report to NetSafe. And NetSafe acts as an intermediary and an expert, subject matter expert. We have three courses available to us. One, we can tell you a problem is not serious enough to, for us to take further action. We will say that more gently, but that is essentially what we mean. We'll pass it back to you and you can wait through the normal processes. Secondly, we can say, we think your, pro your problem is serious enough, you're a young child and you're at risk, or blah, 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 and we will bypass all of the slow processes at Facebook with our uh, special relationship that we have and have content removed or, or blocked, etc. That's option number two. And option number three is we can say, that is a very interesting story you've told us. That is a criminal act, and then we can pass that information to our law enforcement partners. And the Harmful Digital Communications Bill, again, not to get into too much detail about that because of cyberbullying, but basically, it saw that process in action, and it tried to create, it tried to pump some more resource into that process to make that process work better and faster uh, through this uh, civil remedies process there. Um, and then, of course, what we try to do is we try to educate people at, at, at the edge. I've been uh, doing that by explaining to you how a firewall works. Uh, NetSafe has this um, series of, of cybersecurity, uh, it has a whole lot of cybersecurity advice on the NetSafe website. Uh, as was mentioned in the intro, we work with the government. They've created a new brand called Connect Smart. So you can look up Connect Smart uh, and you'll get similar advice. But basically, um, there are some standard things that we can tell you. Have a strong password. And I can explain to you what a strong password is. Right? You will have been watching and paying attention to this presentation right from the start, and you'll remember all those big data breaches, and you'll think, but it doesn't matter how strong my password was if someone stole it. That is true. Nonetheless, if you have strong passwords and, they've, and they vary between sites, that is going to make you more, less likely to suffer a serious breach. You're going to secure your wireless network because unsecured wireless networks are a target for criminals to attach to uh, and undertake some criminal activity, which gets traced back to your wireless network, and, and therefore you. Uh, you're going to back up your files because you heard about that crypto locker thing that that Martin guy was talking about and he said I've got two choices if I get crypto locker one pay the ransom or two go to a backup if I don't have a backup I've only got one option so I'm going to put it back up in place I'm going to update everything because that's uh, that's just the foundation of, of, uh, of successful security and I'm going to think before I click and I have to say this is the hardest part of the whole education program make good choices online don't get tricked. These are all great slogans, but how, how effective uh, are they? 
you know, you, it, it takes a long time to develop the kind of deep knowledge of, uh, of cyber criminals' activities and trickery to always guarantee that you won't fall for, the, for those things. But instead what we do is we make up cutesy uh, things like this, the fishing poster. Uh, see, fishing with a PH, a little technical joke. Uh, and it looks like the thing you see in the, in the takeaways. And just try to raise the profile all the time. Just get people thinking about it. Because the number one thing to keep you secure online is to be constantly aware of the fact that you are facing risk. That the, that the person who is presenting to you may not be the person presenting to you. That the website being presented to you may not be the people you think are behind it. Be constantly aware of that, constantly vigilant about that, and you're much more likely to be safe. So I'll leave it there, and we'll come back for questions later, I guess. Thank you, Martin. Um, I'll call you Martin from now on. I won't make that mistake twice. Uh, right, I should have said earlier that we will have time for questions at the end, so if you've got a present question, just hold on to it, sit tight, and we'll get to those later. I'd now like to welcome to the uh, podium Dr Ryan Coe. Very good evening to everyone. Uh, so my name is Ryan Ko and I'm representing the University of Waikato and the Cybersecurity Lab. So before I begin, I want to ask you a question which is linked to what Martin has talked about, about updates. So how many of you have actually updated your Java regularly? Okay, that's about one quarter here. And uh, I'm going to tell you why this is important. Okay, but this is the typical computer users. What do we say to the Java updates? Not today, not today, okay? And um, as a result, we have this uh, incident happening, uh, which is not linked to cybersecurity, but uh, if you recall, in, on April 15, 2013, uh, there was the Boston Marathon bombing. And because of that, uh, because we're all interconnected and we seek instant gratification on the web, we all want to see a piece of the action. And as a result, the criminals online uh, found a way to push malware into your computers. And that's through giving you what you want. So they'll send you an email which tells you that, hey, there's a video about the Boston Marathon bombing. And you can click here and you can watch the video. So what's happening here is they give you the video. You know, it didn't go to some site. It gives you the video, but while the video is loading, uh, something else is happening. So do you recognize what is this? Anyone? So some of you do. I see some people nodding their heads. So this is a, what they call a black hole exploit kit. Uh, this is, you know, cyber security. Cyber criminals have very fancy names and cyber <laughs> security uh, researchers also have fancy names for the things that they found. So as you can see, this is a kind of like a status report, right? Like a command center. And this is what criminals see. Uh, or rather, the customers of the criminal C. So and all, all you do is, uh, so if you recognize this, uh, this is probably a language in the country, a very large country to the north of everyone. <laughs> um, and it says here, you know, uh, these are the number of computers that, that are visited, uh, that they have spammed, and these are the people who have clicked, and these are the people who have, they have um, successfully installed malware onto, okay? And as you can see here, uh, windows are very much affected. There's a high number of people affected in the US. In this situation, of course, it changes all the while. And another interesting thing that you see here is the number of browsers, the type of browsers that are affected, and also the, what is this? This is, these are the plugins to your browsers, okay? So these are the things that you install on top of your browsers to access different media. And, this also signifies a rise of what we call uh, criminal professionalism. So you wouldn't be surprised to see criminals actually becoming more professional than the service desks that you, you face with the tele telecom companies. So while you're watching the video, what happens here was this. They call it a dispatcher and they go into a yes and no. So they go into this, uh, so they check where you're coming from. They see if you're coming from an IP blacklist. Okay, what is this blacklist? The blacklist is um, if you're a policeman or if you're a, an antivirus company, we will not show all this to you. We will pretend to be okay and they'll, they'll give them a blank page. 
But if you're not a policeman or if you're not an antivirus company, what they'll do is to give to you uh, a series of loads. Okay, they call that loads because they load stuff into your computer while you're watching the video. And these are the different things that are installed. So this is Java version 1.6. If you don't have 1.6, they go to 1.7 and so on and so forth until they find the right hole to put, your, put the thing in. Okay, and these are the relevant um, vulnerabilities. And if Java is not, not the thing to load, they will go into Flash and then they'll go into some other things like if you're using Internet Explorer and so on. Some of the things that they load onto you are quite interesting. For example, they have things that load onto your computers uh, which can control your camera so they can act as a CCTV for the criminals or as a peeping tom too. So these are called rats. And the weird thing about this is these are all freely available online. So uh, it's kind of the trend that is going on and hence I am pessimistic about it. <laughs> so let's look at the blacklist. So this is a this is a screen capture given to me by uh, one of our advisory board members for Cybersecurity Lab, uh, John Oliver. He works in Trend Micro and he told me that you know they get blacklisted so they can't really see so they have to create fake computers that don't look like uh, antivirus companies website and then they get to see that. So you can see Trend Micro, Kaspersky and Symantec being uh, blacklisted by these criminals. And how do you engage them? So behind the scenes, right, all you need is just a motivation. You either hate someone a lot or you are very evil or you just want to have what they call fun, right? So you must be malicious. And they have this site. There used to be this site. It's now closed by the FBI. It's called gangsterbucks.com. And they promise you quite a lot of good service. For example, an individual approach to everyone, guaranteed weekly payouts, round-the-clock support, you know, 24-7, uh, detailed statistics as shown just now, and user-friendly software. You can't even get that with Microsoft sometimes, right? Yeah. <laughs> so how do, they, how do they get paid? You know, so these criminals, they get paid between $7 to $180 per thousand successful loads. Um, but why are they ch charging so, so little? It's because they're not only getting the loads, but they're using you as an excuse to get into the people's computer and then they can steal more stuff, which are the, the fatter cow over there. Okay. And the next question that comes, you know, looking at this landscape and this kind of criminal organization, what do we, what do, we do when we get hacked? So how many of us know what do we do? So can, if you know what to do next, can you raise your hand? Yeah, the first thing is call net safe, right? <laughs> yeah, but there's a lot of things that, that we can't do. You know, we feel helpless after that. You know, I, besides calling net safe, there's nothing else we can do. So the cybersecurity lab is coming together to think about what's happening in five years time. The first problem is we tend to depend on that geeky guy, you know, or that IT guy, you know, somewhere across the room. And that's a big problem because we are not empowering ourselves, we're empowering that guy even more and he could be evil, right? Yeah. The second problem is there's a lack of effective tools for everyone. So our vision in the cybersecurity lab is to create tools which can empower everyone just as easy as it is to send an SMS message. Okay, I'm sure all of you know how to send an SMS message, most of you, at least 90% of you. So that's our goal. Our goal is to, hence our goal is to return control of data to users through this kind of tools. Okay, and it's a new security mindset and we like to call it a cyber civil defense. Okay, so um, hence our lab motto, yeah, return control of data to users and this is what we do and uh, our aim is to be uh, at least the top or if not one of the top in Asia Pacific in five years time uh, in terms of cyber security research and education. So how do we empower users? The first thing is you must know what happened, right? If you are attacked and you do not know that you're attacked, then <laughs> there's nothing much you can do, right? The next thing you need to do is to be able to act on it. You'll be surprised to know that there's a lack of methods to actually address this problem. And the third one is while you're doing all these things, you can still remain private and safe online. Yeah, so these are the three main regions of uh, scope that we are looking at. And hence, these three problems were divided into six uh, research goals by our lab. The first one is provenance, which is what has happened to your data. 
you know, is, is it now out in the cloud and who is touching it right now? Uh, the second one is how do we empower users? How do we design around the user? You know, the third one is how do we see what's happening? Visualization and economics. You know, um, we haven't started on this yet, but we are intending to work with uh, our colleagues from the management school in the future when we have more cases. What, what happened, uh, what is this trying to address is if let's say we have $10 million as a company, right, I'm the CEO, how much am I going to invest in security? Is it $1 or is it $10 million? You know, or zero? You know, sometimes it's zero, right? Yeah, because you have the geeky guy there to help you do stuff. So this is a very interesting thing because the cost is always a major push for what to invest in. And this will then affect everything else. And then we also need to look at the hardware and create data sets for people to do experiments on. But with respect to time today, I'm just going to focus on the top two very briefly. Okay, so let's start with some questions. If no one wants to use our inventions in the lab, then no one wants to use them. Right? No one, if no one wants to use them, we can't empower them. And hence our hypothesis initially was, okay, if we want to empower more users, we have to gain increased uptake. Okay, and how do we gain increased uptake? Probably it's through easy to use tools. So we surveyed the landscape and we found, oh, we go back to square one, <laughs> at antivirus and firewalls, which is what everyone knows here. You see, that's because they were easy to use, people know what they do and what is the result of using them. And why is there such a thing? Um, maybe because there's a less number of clicks, maybe it's just a number of windows being showing up. So relating to that, there were some studies like the Amazon's one-click thing, which increased the sales. You know, you can buy a book with just one click, no keying in of credit card information. And also there's the de web design three-page, three-click rule, uh, where no page is, should be three clicks away. So we looked at this thing and we asked ourselves this question. Uh, is there a relationship between the market share and click count? So one of my master's student and I, we started to look at this and we said, hey, okay, since the antivirus uh, software are easy to use, let's look at each of them, okay? But which, which ones? So we looked at this uh, OpSWAT report, which is a market report for security software, and they said, okay, there's top 16. So we installed them one by one, and it was a pain because it was like a jealous girlfriend, you know? We, Every time we install one, we have to remove the previous one because it says, please forget about the previous one. Let's install this new one. And then it goes on and on 16 times. You see, that's, 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 that's a big problem for us. But eventually we got some figures. We counted the number of clicks and we tabulate them against the market share. So those working in Microsoft would be happy to see this, you know, uh, it's 16.3%. And... Um, Make, making it easier to visualize, there's some sort of a trend uh, where if you have a high market share, you should have some low average number of clicks and vice versa. Uh, this is of course, there's kinks inside there and scientifically, we need to do more experiments on it. You know, So this is interesting. So what does it mean? It means that maybe to empower more people, we have to design tools which you know, in security that are easy to understand and easy to use, okay? And further study is needed on this. So we just covered one part of it and we have to move on to the next one, which is ability to know and the ability to act, to give evidence to the law enforcement agencies to uh, catch the criminals. So some years ago, um, this is a, a situation in, in the cloud. So, you know, we put our stuff in Gmail, we put our stuff in Google and we trust them. We trust that these guys will not access our files. But one of their engineers, the site reliability engineer, uh, broke the trust. So he went on to stalk teenage girls and their chats and their pictures and he was caught. But what's more disturbing here is the fact that it's unclear how widespread his abusers were. Why is it unclear? That brings us to another question. Uh, are the tools nowadays ready to track data activities? Probably not, you know? The next thing, 
Does anyone here knows how the uh, terrorists uh, communicate before the September 11 attacks? Okay, so they use hot mail. Okay. Oh wow. It's <laughs> well, it's not 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 something very 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 uh challenging, right? But what's in what's so clever about this hot mail thing is they did not send any email to each other. What they did was they just created a draft. So someone signs, writes a message, but instead of sending it, he saves it as a draft, signs off, then someone else accesses the account from somewhere else in the world. And then it goes on and on. And they had this communication over the cloud. But no email was sent and no traffic was sent. So nothing was tracked. And hence, that was a big problem, right? Things were going on and they all looked so secure on the front of the existing tools, but many loopholes were happening. So what could have detected this? So we would like to have this notion that uh, this group of tools, which are called provenance tools, what has happened to your data tools, will be able to solve them. So we went on to develop them. So uh, our lab is actually developing something, and thanks to the uh, Re Research Trust Contestable Fund by our research office, we, we were able to build this uh, thing called Progger, a provenance logger. Okay? Uh, it's basically something that you install in a kernel of a computer, the deepest root of the computer, and it tracks stuff, uh, tracks data activities from the lowest possible atomic actions. Create, read, update, and delete. So every create, read, update, and delete is, is tracked. Okay? And then you have very interesting things. For example, in this video, uh, we so this is created by my PhD student Mark uh, and we have this Alice and Bob. So Bob is trying to create a file which has the staff bonus. Okay, so Alice has zero dollars, Bob has one hundred dollars, and Bob thinks that Claire is hardworking, so Claire has one hundred and thirty dollars. So while this is happening, uh, Prager is actually logging everything. It says that something is being created, something is being changed, and so on. So Alice felt something was wrong, so she went on and she tried to access this file that Bob has created. Okay, so what she did was she tried to access it and permission was denied. So she elevated, she had the admin access because she's an administrator. She went into Bob's folder and accessed the folder. So while she was accessing the folder, Prager is actually tracking them, you see. Alice is opening and Alice is closing. Alice is opening this file and she's trying to read the content and so on. So this is what Prager should do and this is what Hotmail should have done, you know, during the September 11 attack and we are trying to address this. So this is one of our projects. And the next thing is Prager not only empowers you with one machine, it maybe can empower the cloud. So a guy created a file on machine A and this malicious cloud administrator went into this machine A, okay? And then he copies from machine A to machine B and he renames it. You know, when you steal something, you will want to rename that file, right? Yeah. So he renamed it as random and, and then he exits. The next thing he did was he logged into the machine B, you know, because machine A is where the, the file was created, right? He don't want to uh he doesn't want to create activities there. So he went to machine B and sends an email out of the cloud. That's it. It's a very simple scenario. And Prager was able to catch that as well. Uh, so this is not the Death Star explosion. Uh this is the uh basically an overview of what has happened just now. Uh so this is a log, but it's very hard to visualize. So we try to simplify it by pruning it from the left to the right. And this is not an eyesight test, so I'm going to zoom in. Okay. Um, so as you can see, we have not some notations here, like files, and what we want to know is the purple line, okay, and and also the different hosts. So starting from the left, you can see that the the program is actually accessing. Uh, so it's the file was created, and there was the console and the text editor being open. Okay, and and we zoom in to the to the leakage track, okay? And a malicious insider copies the file to another machine. And when it was doing the secure copy, it was accessing the known host, which is a typical part of that program. And it travels across to another host, which is another machine. And then it was saved random to random.txt. 
And further down, it was shown here that this duplicate was sent out to the cloud. Yeah, and there was a data leakage. So this is what provenance can do for you. So we have covered the ability to know and the ability to use the tools. But there are many, many more projects in our cybersecurity lab. Yep. And this is my final slide. Uh, yes. <laughs> so what is the number one obstacle to user centricity? Any thing? Ease of use? Yeah, that's one, one of it. But I guess the, the biggest one is user apathy, right? If we do all these things and the users do not pick it up, there's no, no way we can move forward. So we, we should do some education, uh, positive ones, okay? Like social engineering in a positive way, what uh, NetSafe is doing, uh, what Connect Smart is doing. Or maybe even TV shows like Border Security or Woman in Blue, you know, when I'm eating dinner, I like to watch these shows. And um, why not we do something for cybersecurity enforcement agencies, right? And understand what they do and what are the threats. Um, there's also the, of course, the mainstream curriculum and the tertiary curriculum, which is our master of cybersecurity. So here are some of the labs projects. We have contributions to local and uh, global efforts. For example, this is a, um, a popular cloud tool, and we have uh, some contributions to it. But if you're interested, you can go to our website, crow.org.nz, to find out more. So thank you for your attention. Thank you, Ryan. I'm sorry for ringing the bell, but we have to give everyone time. Uh, so thank you for that. And I'd now like to welcome Wayne Rumbles as our final speaker for the evening. So I get the last 10 minutes. Uh, I'm used to talking for 50 minutes blocks, so I'll, I'll try and get through it. Um, what you're seeing at the moment is, uh, it's not quite real time, because I've, I've videoed it this afternoon, but it, it's a real time attack. So basically it's a bunch of servers around the world that have got vulnerabilities in them, and they're set up so they can watch people um, trying to attack them. Um, you can see there's a lot of activity towards the US. Uh, <clears throat> So much of the law is reactionary. It, creates a, it is created to deal with a problem and then kicks in when that problem arises again. In many instances, um, the law kind of acts as this ambulance at the bottom of the cliff. But the internet provides some interesting um, challenges for, for the law. Lawrence Lessig uh, wrote an article back in, 19, um, in 1999 with a simple premise that regulation of the internet can be achieved through four regulatory map, um, modalities. One of, the, uh, one of these on its own will not be a success, and they need to work together. Uh, what you're seeing now is vulnerabilities. So the first one was at actual attacks. This is vulnerabilities in systems. Um, New Zealand ends up about number 50-something, usually. Um, so there's four modalities uh, law, and it does that through statute and regulation and case law. Um, the market, access to technology, its price point, um, social norms, as, as we've already been mentioned, education like NetSafe, or self-regulation by private organisations. And the final is architecture and code um, through software or embedded code in the hardware. Law can be in, in, uh, used to enhance all those other modalities. Um, in the market, we can make it mandatory that all network equipment is sold with full versions of um, security software. Parliament could set a policy that, um, and, and, and has through its 2011 cybersecurity strategy to fund and ensure public and business education. Now, come back, we'll step back to New Zealand. Prior to 2003, we had no cyber security, or was no cyber um, law around the criminal activity. Um, prior to this, judges and prosecutors had to be creative. We had to stretch the existing law to fit the cyber crimes. For example, prosecuting a hacker who hacked, a te hacked the telecom um, telephone network using um, you know, one of these um, 
uh, terms a, a blue box type of freaking software called Scavenger that he downloaded off the internet. Um, he used that to defraud telecom with hundreds of thousands of dollars worth of um, um, international um, toll calls. So he had, he had downloaded the software um, and used it to manipulate a telephone exchange in Spain. And that sent a clear forward signal, basically telling the telecom that there was no one talking on that phone while he was connecting uh, multiple people together. Now, this was back in 2001 when it went to, went to court. With no specific hacking law in place, Mr. Misick was charged with using a document to defraud. Um, <clears throat> The court had to stretch, stretch the meaning of document in the Crimes Act to include the scavenger software program that he had downloaded off the internet, um, which the court accepted and thus gave an avenue to prosecute the hacker, um, who at least had gained a monetary advantage out of those activities. So even with trying to expand and in some case manipulate the ex existing law, much of hacking activity would fall outside these limited um, sections. However, in 2003, we made an amendment to the Crimes Act enabling hacking laws, um, or as Parliament named them, crimes involving computers, to be prosecuted. And as of 2003, um, it became a criminal offence to gain access to a computer network to copy, modify, or delete files in a system without authorization. We created four new um, crimes. Uh, these offences were accessing a computer for a um, dishonest purpose um, and carried a, carries a possible maximum sentence of seven years. The courts have included um, the dishonest um, as the dishonest purpose is things like accessing an ex-girlfriend's email for a year after their separation so they, he could watch and delete her emails because he didn't, um, if he didn't like what she was saying or what some of who she was contacting. Um, accessing Trade Me with stolen credit cards to buy a computer to buy computer equipment. Foolishly, he then put them up for sale on Trade Me as well, and the person he bought them off noticed that. Um, <clears throat> Even to, uh, to using an email um, to, uh, to Eve Fonterra to redirect the shearing, mil shearing milking payment um, that normally went half to the farmer, normally half to the share milker, the email um, suggested to Fonterra that it all goes to the share milker and that was counted as accessing a computer system um, for a dishonest purpose. Section 250. <clears throat> um, creates a, an offence for damaging and interfering with the computer system. The courts got very nervous about this because it included um, it included de de uh, deleting, modifying, or impairing any data. So how many of, most of you have probably deleted something you didn't mean to, even knowing that um, it, it may have caused um, damage or it may have caused loss or, or, or what. So the courts became very um, nervous about this one. And when, when the first case um, came before the courts, the court took a practical approach um, and said that deletion or, or modification needs some deliberate criminal action. Uh, in terms of deletion, there needed to be more than just putting it in the trash bin, um, clicking delete, uh, that you needed to show that someone took some extra steps to stop people being able to recover that, that, that material. The third um, offence, although no one's been charged under this as far as I know, um, is making, selling, distributing, possessing um, software for committing a crime. So basically hacker software, um, uh, putting that up onto a, onto a site, distributing that, proposing that um, people can use that is an offence under the Crimes Act. And finally, the last one is accessing a computer system without authorization. You don't have to do any damage. You don't have to have, have just accessing, this, accessing the system is enough. And um, our courts have interpreted this very, very widely to include even uh, an unfortunate young chap who was, um, well, he was on parole, and he went along to the police station and he was sitting Waiting, waiting to see one of the officers, got a bit bored, so he reached across the counter and turned the computer around, clicked the mouse. 
He didn't, couldn't go any further um, because there was a password screen that came up, so it was just a splash screen, um, and he was, he was charged um, with accessing a computer without authorization, so just by clicking the mouse. Um, the judge didn't, gave him, you know, basically uh, no conviction, um, let him go home, um, but the police um, uh, took, that, took that forward. Um, also, the, uh, an another quick case was a priest using an ATM uh, machine to transfer money from the church to his personal account so he could go gambling at the casino. Um, that was also considered accessing a computer system without, um, without authorization. This, this section would also include so-called um, white, um, white hat hacking, um, where a person claims that they're only demonstrating the vulnerabilities in a system, and even if they revealed it um, to the organisation concerned, they could be prosecuted under that. So as you can see, the, the courts have taken a wide interpretation of these sections. So why aren't our courts flooded with these cases? Well, there's a few problems. Um, one, users are hard to find often. They appear to be anonymous, although you can, there are ways to reveal um, um, who, their identity. They don't have to be in the same jurisdiction. They can be across the globe, and, um, and one of our own um, famous hackers, uh, Owen Walker from Whangarei, he used servers throughout Malaysia to attack uh, uh, the US. So you don't even have to be, um, the, the actual computers using to attack don't even have to be in the same jurisdiction as, as, the, as the user. You can have multiple victims, and as um, some of the cases um, we've already seen, um, is the, the victims can be distributed, and it's hard um, for law enforcement to, um, to bring that together. The volatility of the evidence. Um, as as, as um, Ryan was showing in, in that list of, the computer system is changing constantly. And our courts are, and, and rule laws of evidence want to, sit, want to be proved that the, that, the ev that the material they are given was exactly the same as that in terms of the crime. And because digital evidence is so volatile and changeable, um, this causes a problem for, for our courts. Encryption. Strong encryption is unbreakable in a, in a sense for, for a time to get to court. And um, one case in child pornography, downloading child pornography, he had eight gigabytes of, of material in, in encrypted. He forgot the encryption key, um, so therefore um, the court were unable to prosecute um, that person for, the, for that material because it was encrypted and there was no way of accessing that. And reporting of crimes, as um, Martin mentioned, there is a, there is a, there's some reporting through the orb, but that's just the tip of the iceberg. A lot of people don't. If you're, if you're a victim of one of those romance um, scams, uh, you, might not, you might feel twice, uh, think twice about it, um, talking to, to the police. And commercial sensitivity. If I'm a financial, um, you're kidding. Really? <laughs> <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, can I just whiz through a few things? One of the other issues in terms is not only getting to court, it is um, facing, in New Zealand, we have um, huge discretion on when to prosecute and when to not. If you turn up to a police station um, and say, I think my computer's been hacked, the most likely um, response you will get is, thank you, good night. Uh, <clears throat> Now, this is not because um, our police uh, don't necessarily care about that. It is resources. If you're a police officer, you're faced with um, property, real property crime that you can see and feel. Um, you're faced with um, violence and, um, and uh, uh, perhaps uh, domestic abuse, then something that you can't even see, you can't understand, um, it's difficult to find out who the perpetrator is, is going to be pushed down in terms of the um, priorities. I believe we're at least a generation away from, from, from changing this. We need a new generation of um, lawyers, and we've been, we've been teaching cyber law for 
about eight years at our law, law faculty. Um, Auckland does it as well. So gradually those lawyers with a little bit of knowledge are, are moving out. We need a new generation of police that are digital natives that understand what people are talking about and it takes a little bit longer but it's a new generation of judges as well um, to be able to actually grasp what's going on here. Now I was going to talk about international law but we'll whiz through that. Some areas of international co co cooperation work quite well in the, in the cyber security. This is Owen Walker. Um, he was, came to the attention of the FBI when he crashed the server at the Pennsylvania University um, uh, on behalf of a, of a fellow student who um, felt aggrieved. Now, he also had um, been uh, hacking into um, the Netherlands. So the first hour police found out about him was when the FBI turned up and the Netherlands police knocked on their door, said... Um, Mr. Owen Walker um, has, been doing, has been doing these activities. Now, all three jurisdiction, had jurisdictions. Criminal, he had committed a crime in, in the US. He committed a crime in, in the Netherlands. He committed, well, probably in, the, in, in Malaysia as well. Um, and he committed crime here in New Zealand. Um, through international cooperation, they decided his best place for him to be tried was in New Zealand, and the information from the FBI was handed over to the New Zealand police. So it worked quite well. Doesn't always work that way. Um, Mr. Dot Com, uh, we're some, some years down in terms of trying to extradite him. Um, according to the US, he is um, a, a severe a cyber criminal, even though his copyright breaches wouldn't be a criminal act in New Zealand. Um, but <clears throat> this other one here is um, Gary McKinnon. I will stop in a minute. Um, uh, he hacked uh, 94 computers in the US from the UK. Uh, he, was, he was looking for, he believed in a UFO cover-up that um, the US government was, was hiding a UFO that they had, they had discovered, and he deleted files from the US Army computers. Um, and um, he deleted Navy weapons logs from a naval base computer system which shut down um, the, the, the Navy base, and this was um, not long after September the 11th. Um, the estimated costs of that were around $700,000 US. Extradition claim began with the UK by the US in 2005, and it was not until 2012 that the um, Home Secretary decided that sending, um, sending uh, Mr McKinnon to the US would, for a lengthy prison sentence would likely cause him harm, um, and um, he was... He is not to be extradited, but may still be prosecuted for that in the UK. One more slide. Um, just leave that the, up there um, in terms of the future. Um, thank you. I feel so mean cutting down everyone's time, but we have run out of time. Um, we've run over time, but we do have um, some time for questions. So, uh, and I've just been asked to mention that tonight's lecture will be loaded on iTunes, uh, the University of Waikato site within two weeks. So if you want to look at it, then uh, that will be there. Um, meanwhile, I'm terrified and I'm gonna go home and back up all my files and I'm never gonna watch a video online again. Um, but we do have some time for questions, and there's some microphones in the uh, audience or circulating. So if you have any questions, just raise your hand or stand up, and somebody can bring a microphone to you, and you could address your question either to any of the individual speakers or to them as a whole. Could I ask um, the cybersecurity experts on the panel whether they themselves use internet banking with full confidence? <laughs> <laughs> there's a microphone there for you. Yes, yeah. Uh, yes, yes I do. Uh, not only do I use the uh, internet banking, I also use the app on my phone. Um, but uh, that may be because I'm slightly less expert than Ryan. <laughs> I, I use that, but I enable this feature called the multi-factor authentication. Uh, that would help me to know whether someone else has accessed my bank account without me knowing it. Uh, if I access my bank account, I'll get an SMS which gives me another password to log in. 
Yeah, so that's what I do. But I use it with trepidation as well. <laughs> <laughs> so the future, as I see it, is our world's only going to get more digital. Our assets are becoming more virtual. Um, and, and more and more of the information about us will be harvested and analysed online. The law plays a vital role, but it's not that whole answer. Um, the law, there will be new cyber-specific laws, and um, already, we've already mentioned the ha Harmful Digital Communications Bill, which is um, going through its process at the moment. Existing law will be further developed, and the Privacy Act is one that is, is, has been targeted. Um, Law will be used to strengthen the other modalities of regulation on, on, on the internet. Technology and the stuff that Ryan's is doing um, will get more sophisticated and will get more secure um, software, but so will the cyber criminals. The social norms will change slowly through education, self-regulation and new online norms, and um, especially, and I predict, in terms of privacy. If I had another hour, we could talk about um, the Google case in terms of privacy. But um, Also, the market. The market through customer demand, policy directive, and legislation threatened or real. Um, and, and this, I believe, in, in the area of cloud computing especially, um, many jurisdictions are looking at how can we deal with, with the security of cloud computing as we move both our commercial and our personal assets into the, into the cloud. But there's one thing missing, and that's you every one of you. And one thing, if I can plea from, um, from tonight, is if you do get hacked, if a scam happens, go to the orb, report it. It's the only way that we're going to get resources into um, the police um, and into, into, the, into the legal arena. Governments react because the public react. Governments, if, if they can't see it, it's not really an election issue unless it's brought to their attention. So the one thing, remember the site, and if you don't remember the site, go to NetSafe, and they'll have a link on it. Um, and please report anything that happens. Cheers. Thank you, Wayne. I'd now like to invite back to the stage the Deputy Vice-Chancellor, Professor Jones, to close the evening. Um, thank you very much, uh, Brenda, for facilitating this evening, although I think you can be more tough with your chair of department or chair of school. Um, I'm sure that, and I also th want to thank um, Ryan, Wayne and Martin for your presentations in an area that continues uh, to increase in global significance and impact on our daily lives. To our guests in the audience, thank you for attending and for your contributions this evening, and I'd like to take the opportunity to remind you of next week's lecture. That's entertainment. What does the future of viewing look like? Many of us grew up with the 6 p.m. Some of us don't get to see it anymore, news, um, as our main intake of news for the, for the day. Now people are getting information anywhere, anytime, in any format. Just enough, just, just now, and just for me. This combined with the rise of celebrity culture has completely changed the entertainment landscape. What will be the future of entertainment be? Will movie theatres survive? Will we ever be free from celebrities? Our speakers next week include uh, Faculty of Arts and Social Science Screen and Media Associate Professor Jeff uh, Leland, author Julie Thomas, and wireless senior producer Megan Whelan. And the evening will be facilitated by University of Waikato alumnus TV presenter Jesse Mulligan. Thank you again for coming. I'd like to encourage you to continue uh, mingling and pick up a brochure for the rest of the lecture series uh, and more information. Please feel free to stay for a drink at the Opus Bar, and if tonight's lecture has inspired you to enrol in uh, Master's Cy Cyber Security or Wayne's um, uh, Cyber Law, I encourage you to do so. Thank you very much. The University of Waikato, where the world is going. <laughs>